So all I'm going to show you now before lunchtime is very simple things. Just how do you read in your FCS files and, you know, just looking at what they look like inside R um, and some simple visualizations of your data. So I'm going to try to take it slow for this first, first hour and a half. And I guess I already have everything opened here. But just if you go to File, Open File, and then you just navigate to Documents, Workshop, and open up the file that you're. So we don't have it. Did you get it? Yeah, it works. All right, well, in case between. Did you get module two? It's on the wiki. Yeah. Do we have module two? You do? Okay, great. Right. So open up our studio. Uh, what code, right? Yeah, I just need the code. Yeah. That's, that's There's no. No, they're already in the virtual machine. Okay, so now open up this one. And you should see something like this. Does everybody have this? Yes? Good. Okay, so um, some of you have used R before, some of you haven't really too much used it, maybe just a little. Uh, it's really just like a ginormous calculator. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's not necessarily, it can be a programming language, but it's really not necessary for you to be a programmer or anything like that to use it. So I just want you guys to get a little bit comfortable with, with the things that are done. So for example, so first of all, this is how you can run the code without having to copy and paste it, is just scroll down to the first line of the code like this. And you can press Control Enter. And how does that work on Mac? Control Enter. Oh, great. And now do you see how here in the bottom, this is the console, this is where the code actually gets executed? It basically copy and pastes it for you. So you can go line by line and just do control enter. That's how we execute lines. So this first thing is just us, everybody is familiar with the term variable and assigning a value to the variable. So now x is a variable and it has the value 5. Now y is the variable and has the value 10. And what you can do is any kind of calculator type operation with it. Everybody's comfortable with this so far? Good. Now, what we're going to be working with is vectors and matrices. So I'm just going to give you a little example of what this is what a vector is. It's basically a, a bunch of values concatenated together. So x is now a vector. If you just type x and press Control Enter to execute, it prints out the values that x contains. This is another way of defining a vector. So one way is you just type in the values that you want the vector to have. Another one is, let's say you want to come up with a really long vector from, with the values from 1 to 100. You're not going to want to type 1, 2, 3, 4. So you can do sequence, which now when you print y, sequence from 1, 2, 3, by 1. If you press the up arrow, it will show you the previous commands that have been entered in the console. You can change this to be to 100. And now when you print y, there's all those numbers. This is going to come in handy in our programming, and I just want you to be comfortable with what, that, what this is. It's, it's nothing scary. So far, so good? Now, when you encounter a term that you, don't, you haven't seen before, there's actually really good help in R. And the way that you get help is you just put a question mark in front of the term that you're searching for. And so Control-Enter on that line and over here suddenly the help menu opens up a whole thing for you and you can read about what is a matrix object how to create a matrix object um, typically this is where it would sort of describe an overview of what you're asking for help with and then typical usage it will show you, you know this is how you call this function some details about the parameters and probably the thing you're most interested in is the examples down here. 
So here's some really fancy matrix that someone made. That don't worry about understanding this. It is a quite fancy uh, matrix build. Here's a, one way that you build a matrix. You basically give it all of the values that you want in it. You tell it n row means number of rows. How many rows do you want the matrix to have? Number of columns. So let's print out A and see what A looks like. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah? Another way to create a matrix is by how if you have two vectors of the same size, you can just put them together into a matrix instead. So R bind means row bind x and y, and I guess I didn't execute these things properly. It gave me that warning, it didn't give it to you maybe because I, I made y to be 100 instead of 3. So there you go. So you can just bind the two vectors by row, row-wise, and you get this, this matrix. Now you can perform operations on matrices. Notice how A is a 2 by 3 matrix, and so is this new matrix that I made. It's also 2 by 3. If I add the two of them together, it just adds each entry. So this entry, the first entry, with this entry is 2. Right? So it just does element-wise operations. Now this is where we're going to be using this kind of notation a lot, so I want to just go over it quickly. You can index the matrix to give you specific entries. The first value you put inside here is the row number, and this is the column number. So you have to be a space? No, that's just for uh, prettiness. <laughs> Readability. I've, yeah, it's not Python. There's no white space cool. limitation. Um, so here's A. The first row, the third column, is the number 3. That's what I got, right? If I want the whole row, I just leave the column number empty and there's no need to be a space there. This is the whole second row of A. Here's the whole first column of A. Notice that it prints it you know, horizontally, but, but it is the first column. So does everybody, is everybody comfortable with a matrix? I know it seems like extremely simple, useless stuff that I'm showing you, but we will be using this so much that if you're not comfortable with this, you're going to get extremely confused. That's why I'm just going over it. Another thing that we're going to be using is what are called lists. And they're exactly what they sound like. It's just a list of things. And a matrix really is sort of like a list, but really you can only put numbers in it in order for it to make sense. Here in the list, you can put anything you want. So here's, I define this silly object called my list. And you can give names to the objects that you have. Here I put the object x that I had before, the vector. Um, I gave another name to the second entry. And my second entry was my original vector y. Now if I want to only access the first entry of my list, Remember how with a vector you can subset it by just putting one th one of those square brackets and you get the first entry or the second entry. With a list, it's just double square brackets just because it's like inception, going a little bit deeper. <laughs> <laughs> but what if I what if I have a list of a hundred things and they're all maybe they're all FCS samples, for example, and they all have names and I want to get the one that's for Bob, but I don't remember if it's like the 50th or the 51st. I want to get Bob's FCS file. So you can also subset a list. You can recall an entry from a list by calling it by its name. So that's where Ryan was saying annotation comes in very useful because if you have it all correct, you could have a list of FCS files that are, some of them are named control, some of them are named stained. This makes it easier to, to access things by name as opposed to by index number. What if you try to access the third entry of the list? Error? Doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. That's right. 
So R will give you fairly decent error messages. Um, try to. <laughs> 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 uh, I mean, subscript out of bounds. Like this is our subscript, right? You know that this is a simple example. It's clear that we only put two things in it. We're trying to get the third one. There is no third one. There is an error. So that's what Ryan was saying. You know, there there's gonna be a bug, but you can debug it. It's right there in front of you. It may be less obvious in some other cases, but uh, what else can you do with a list? You can get the length of a list. So it, it's intuitive that this function exists, but I'm showing it to you that, that it's there. You can also get the length of a vector. The vector has three entries. A matrix has two dimensions, so you can get the dimensions. What happens if you type length A? has six entries in total. That's not very informative. I would rather know the dimensions of the matrix. So is everybody OK with this subsetting by index or by name thing? OK. So that was stuff that you probably are already familiar with. I didn't know exactly what you've been doing with R before, so I just wanted to make sure we have the basics. Um, here's some more advanced functionality of R. So I can generate uh, 20 random numbers using the function R norm. If, if you were to be looking at through one of those uh, bioconductor package vignettes where they're t talking about how this is how you use the package. You first you do this and then you do that and they're going to have some code. There's going to be a function in there they didn't in detail describe. For example, they'll never explain to you what length of a matrix or whatever is, right? You're going to assume you have some understanding. So if you see a function that they're using and it really doesn't make sense to you what it's doing and why, just do a question mark. R norm. What, it, what is that? What are they doing? Oh, there. It's, it's, they're just basically finding, go to the details, read, read, read. And they're basically just giving you random numbers generated from a normal distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation 1. So you know that it's, I actually didn't know what this stood for the first time I saw it. I had to look it up myself. I didn't, like, what's the R for? Random. So let's print A. So there's 20 random numbers generated from a normal distribution. Now, what I want, what we're going to be working quite a bit with is which. How many people here have used which before? Excellent. <laughs> Very good. You're a pro. <laughs> which entries of A are greater than zero? That's what that statement says. And what, is, what does this three mean? Does anyone know? It means three. How does this is the position in A, the third entry is greater than zero. That's what you asked R, right? Which entries of A are bigger than zero? The third one, the fourth one. You guys will have different random numbers, right? So you will not see this exact same thing. In fact, we can assign this to a variable, pause num. OK, must I am. <laughs> so I want to double check that this is correct. So I'm going to subset the third entry. Yes, it's positive. I don't want to subset each and every one. I can actually subset all of them like this. Does this make sense? Or is it too fast? Sense. Good. So, yeah. The, or, or instead of assigning it to a, to a new variable, you can actually directly just type it in one line. A, which A are greater than zero. That's a way to get all of the positive entries of A out. You can do the same for, let's also check which ones are less than negative 1. The 7th, 13th, and 15th, and 19th. Um, the equation y squared 
here, yeah. we are subsetting A, which is a vector, right? So if I do A subset the third entry, sure. if you do A round brackets third entry, it's going to be like A is not a function. Remember how so length is a function so and you put round, 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 brackets is really round brackets is when you are calling so a function. Uh, square squares when you're subsetting, like you're, you're subscripting or whatever. <laughs> so let's say that for whatever reason you're interested in all the positive entries and all the entries less than negative one. How would that ever relate to anything that we, we ever do? Would be, let's say I'm not A is actually the expression values of the CD3 stain. And I want to get all of the entries that are greater than my threshold value for my gate, right? So I'm going to be doing something very, very similar. This is why I'm going over this example. So let's say you want to get all the ones of greater than 0 and all less than negative 1. So if I intersect those two, I get this integer 0 thing. And it means that the, their intersection is empty. So here's a set of indices, which ones are positive, a set of indices which are less than negative 1. What is the intersection? Well, none, right? You can't have a positive number that's less than negative 1. So I'm not going to intersect them. I'm going to take their union instead. And here's how you do that. You just type union. It's a function. You can actually look it up if you want. Union x comma y. That's that's how it works. Where x and y are vectors of the of the same type, so they're both vectors of numbers. So here's one set of numbers I have. This is my the ind the indices of the entries of a which are positive, and there there's another one I have the ones that are negative one. And I'm gonna combine them. Now when you print combined, remember these were all my positive entries, these are all the ones less than negative 1 that, that I had. How many do I have? 13. So when we're later, when we're doing gating, and you want us a, imagine A is an a list of expression values for the CD3 stain, and you get all of the ones that are greater than 5 because your gate is 5, you can, you can do this thing, see what the length is of that, Let's say it's 110 cells or greater than 5. You know the whole length of your original, all of your cells is, let's say you started with 200 cells. Then you can do, okay, 110 of them are greater than 5, so my proportion of C3 positive cells is 110 divided by 200. <clears throat> right? So that's sort of where we're going with this. So is that good so far? Okay. Let's plot A. So notice here I put the color is red. This is just one of the many, many plotting options that you can, that R gives you. And uh, I'm, I'm going to be showcasing just a few of them here and there as we go because it can get quite complicated. It's actually, R has amazing visualization capabilities. And if ever you come across a time when you're using this and you want to publish a paper and you want a really good looking graphic, there's a, um, just Google R plots and there's this website where people have submitted all these really good looking plots and the code for them. So this is just a simple dot plot. So what, what, are, what do we have on the x-axis is just the index of A. So one would be the first entry of A, mine happened to be negative, let's see negative 0.8, right? There it is. So it's just a simple dot plot, nothing fancy. Let's now plot the density of A. Remember how A we took from a random normal distribution? This sort of looks like a normal distribution. It's, it's got a little kink here. That's Yours, yours will look different. You have different random numbers. Um, that's because with just 20 numbers, you can't really reproduce the whole density distribution of normal distribution. Hist of A produces a histogram plot. 
you guys will obviously have seen this in FCS Express or Flojo, I guess. I don't know this Flojo. Excel. There you go. You can do Excel in R. <laughs> so you're so you're familiar with what this plot looks like. What if you do hist a? What if we see what what hist actually does? Look at all the possible parameters you can add to the call to the function hist. You can actually. It, this is a lot of information. It will take you a long time to actually read through and understand. But one thing you can do is add this number afterwards, which will give you 15, try to break it into 15 bars, your, your data. If you give it 20, it, it, you, you only really have 20 numbers, so you can't really go that high. So these are just some of the very basic plotting functions. Let's take a look at this plotting region here. You can, by the way, I don't know if you noticed that I have my this tab here closed so that my plots will be a little bit bigger. You can just close it and open it if you need to. This basically stores a history of all the commands you have been entering in your RStudio session. If you take a look at this plot, you can actually go back and it will take a a second for some of you that have slower computers and see what you've been plotting you know if you forgot or plotted something before you looked at the one that was there you can also go to export and you can save your plot as an image or as a PDF so if you make one that's really pretty you can save it does that does everybody have that everybody's good good so we got through plotting a dot plot, a density plot, a histogram. Uh, you can directly plot something by creating, a, this is basically creating a random normal distribution of a thousand entries. I'm taking its density and plotting it. So you can nest functions within functions. R will First, generate the innermost thing, right? It's just like math, you know, with brackets. It's going to do the thing inside the innermost brackets first. Then it's going to go, I guess it is a lot like Inception, no, now that you just, mentioned. Oh my so gosh. It's like Inception. <laughs> okay, there you go. It's like confusing. Okay, <laughs> so are we okay on this stuff? Everybody's fairly comfortable with this. It wasn't too insane or anything. Good. Let's now go to flow cytometry stuff, <laughs> <laughs> stuff you care about. First of all, how do you read a flow, uh, an FCS file? <clears throat> no documentation, it says. That's weird. Why would I do that? <laughs> what if you do two question marks? Like, really, really no documentation? Suddenly it brings something up. <laughs> so, um, like Ryan was saying, because there's so many packages out there, R doesn't want to just load all of them up because your computer is going to be really slow. You only load the functionality that you need as you go, basically. So the first time I asked asked how to read .fcs, what is that? It didn't find it because I hadn't loaded the relevant package. But because it's installed on my computer, R is able to like, OK, let me look into it further for you if you really need to know. And it actually went through the help files of all the un the packages I haven't brought into R yet. And it found this stuff here. This stuff before these two columns, that's the name of your package. So it, it's bringing up matches to read.fcs, and then there's this read.fcs header. I don't know what that is. I really wanted to just read an FCS. So click on that. And look up here. It tells you the package name. This is the thing you need to load into R in order to be able to access this functionality. So that function is in that package. Exactly. It's only after you read that package that you're going to be able to use that as a function. Other functions such as length that we used, that one was like the basic R stuff. Like it's already loaded because like you need to be able to start somewhere. So let's do that. This is how you load a library. Or you, that, this is how you load a package into R and tell it, okay, from now on I want you to load this because I'm going to be using it. 
<laughs> and some red stuff <coughs> happens. <laughs> This red stuff, it's ignore it. As long as there's no error. Yes, then you will see a big error right here somewhere, and then you will notice it. <laughs> and then that will be. Clear, and that, how, do, how would you address that? Let's say that you get an error. What, what would you do? Google. Google. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> The good thing about it is that it's true. There's so many errors that people have definitely experienced. You're not, believe me, you're not the first one to have this error. You know, you're not that special. So someone has already answered it online. Okay, so now we have our package loaded. We're going to be reading in an FCS file that's stored on the computer, right? So I need to tell R what directory it's stored in. So I need to know. I need R needs to know what directory I'm going, going to be working with. Get WD stands for get working directory. Where does R think we are at now? Like what folder is R by default looking at? It's work looking at just the, it's kind of like if you have a Windows machine, it's, it, this would be like your user slash Armstrong, whatever your username is. It's not like in my documents or anything like that. So let's tell it where we want it to be set working directory this is the function and you give it the exact path on your machine where your data is stored didn't tell you anything it just did it now what if I do get working directory again now we're there dir directory dir <laughs> <laughs> it uh, lists all the things that are in, that are in that folder. Why don't we open up the folder and just make sure we, we are on the same page? So open up the folder icon. Go to Documents, Workshop, Data. Okay, so you can see down here a little bit. It's telling you that there's this stuff in there. This has a dot on it. It's a hidden file. So, actually, the first three files we're going to work with are in the folder full FCS. Let's check out what's in there. Those three FCS files. So these are the kinds of files you guys would be reading in. So this is how you read a file. You say read.fcs and you give it the actual path to the file relative to the current directory you're in. Right now I'm in the data folder. Within that folder I have full fcs folder slash the file name. So execute that. It's going to take... How, how's it going? Good? Is it loaded already? <coughs> okay, good. Excellent. Excellent. So there is a warning message there, and it's basically, as long as it's not an error, it's safe to continue <laughs> and then read it. And if it's something obvious that there's you know, something you should do about it, do, do something about it. But in this case, it's kind of, there's some things where people didn't save their FCS file exactly like the package ex expects it to be saved. There's like maybe they're missing some some of the metadata that Brian was talking about. They haven't saved, you know, what is the cytometer name that you use to acquire these files. So it's okay, we can still work with the data. It's just letting you know it's not this is not like the perfect file ever. So let's print F. So this is what uh, an FCS file looks like inside of R. It's this object F. It's called a flow frame object. Remember how before we were working with vectors and matrices and lists? Those are objects. This is a flow frame object. So it's just a different type of object. What do we know about the file just from reading this? 
one piece of information that we know about the file just from looking at this. Be brave. Do we know how many cells were acquired? Yes. We have 65,000 cells that were acquired. We know what channels were recorded. Forward scatter area, height, side scatter area, all of these other ones that, you know, someone did a good job of annotating them and putting all of the antibody and whatever other things are called in biology. I'm not a biologist, I'm a mathematician, so if I say something that sounds funny to you guys, it's because of that. So this basically contains sort of the overview of what the FCS file is. What kinds of things can we do with, with, with this object? Remember how with the vector we could see the length of it, how many entries it has? With this, it's number of rows. So here it kind of treats every single cell that passes through the full cytometer as one row of data. Full of, let's look at what it, how, what it looks like. So when I put a length in this, it just helps me there's one file. Exactly, yeah, there's only one file. Because some, sometimes there's a way that you can save actually two flow frames within one. Like it's, it's silly, so it's but like yeah, it, it looks fairly useless. So don't, it, it, yeah. you, you shouldn't see any reason to ever use length on a flow frame, right? N row is the one that you should probably be using. Let's see what else we can do. The column names. So it's almost like like a matrix, you know, it has rows and columns. The rows, there's 65,000 of them, so each cell has one row. The columns, there's, those are just the channels, you know, that we're measuring. So it looks like each cell is one row, and each of those entries in the row is just the measurement of the channel for that cell. How do we get that, the ex how do we see that matrix, though? It looks like a matrix, but how do we get it? It's through the function express. It's the expression value stored in it. So I'm going to put this into a matrix and I'm going to take its dimension and surely enough it has 65,000 rows and 16 columns. I'm not going to be printing E because it's going to be really really long. It's going to take up all of your, you're not going to be able to see what's in it. But remember how we can subset things and in matrices, like we can get the first row, third column kind of thing. And remember, what what does this do? If I just do one to ten, like one column ten, it gives you all the numbers from one to ten. So let's say I want to look at the first ten cells in in this matrix. Does it show you the same thing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because now I'm going to be able to work with this as a matrix. So I'm going to be able to add another matrix to it. I'm going to be able to subset certain rows and columns. Um, whereas just F is not a matrix, it's a flow frame. It just so happens that they did create this function for the flow frame that has the same functionality as the matrix. And when you do that, you annotate it and tells you which ones are bits and what's around this. Yeah. So someone was very smart at making this package. Was it you? No. <laughs> no, no, no. This is a extremely involved package. I would never know. Don't put brackets, just type it in and press enter. And a lot of times, this is the code. I did not write this, right? Like, it's code. Yeah. I don't, I don't think you're yeah. too interested in no. understanding. I don't think it should be something you go through, right? Um, so this is the effort that people go through when they write a package, right? Just so that you guys can do dim, and it will give you the number of rows and parameters and stuff. Uh, but a lot of times, actually, there are some functions that you can print out like this and see, and maybe there's some functionality within it that you want to copy and change a little bit for your case. That totally great idea. A lot of them, when they're actually kind of hidden a little bit, they don't show you every little thing they do. Um, 
just because it would be too confusing. But you're welcome to give it a try. So let's look at let's just look at the very first the very first row of the matrix E that contains our expression values. So what does this mean? The very first cell that went through the cytometer and the lasers hit it and blah blah detector something. <laughs> and some stuff was measured, and here's the stuff that was measured. We had 27,700 units, units, I'm using my units, right, <laughs> of, uh, the, for the forward scatter area. And then this is for the height and, and the side scatter. And I had the, the value 19, or 1, 1,984 for this channel, the B515 channel and 625 for the R780 channel, which was the, CD, the one measuring CD3, and so on. Does this make sense? So if I wanted to get what was the first cell, how, how would you get what was the first cell's side scatter area measurement? How would you get that? Yes. Or, if you didn't want to be like one, two, three. Yeah. Like this, right? In quotations, yes. Sorry. Why do we have the quotations? What's the difference between those ones and those ones? None. None? No. Those are the same as those? Yeah. In some programming languages, it matters. In this one, not so much. So why why couldn't I just type? You know, why did I need the quotations? Because if I type x, that's my variable. If I type x, that's just the letter x, right? So if I didn't have the quotations, it's going to be looking for some variable ssc minus some other variable a, right? It doesn't make sense. So we have to have the quotations. So, so you might be able to clean it up when I have cheated hyphens in there. It's not a big deal if there's a hyphen. It's just if, as long as everything's in the quotations. <coughs> yeah, as long as R knows that not to try to access it as a variable. Okay, so now we know how to access, you know, some cell, like maybe the first... Why don't we look at the first 10 cells, the side scatter area measurements. So the first 10 cells, this is what they look like. Remember how we use that function which to see you know, our normal random variable, which ones are positive, which ones are negative? We can, we can do that now with, with this. So what does this line say? So you've called for all of the all of the cells in the side scatter. You've asked which of them are they have side scatter more than five hundred. Yes. Shut up. Oh, I'm concentrating. <laughs> <laughs> And you're actually just asking the number of, basically the number of cells below the side scatter that more than Yep. This is how many cells I have in total, right? So if I wanted to, I could now divide by, it's going to tell me that, in fact, here's a really complicated one. 10% of my cells have side scatter greater than 500. So there. <laughs> now we've used the thing we learned earlier. So <laughs> Finally. You need to set your gates a little bit better because you've got too many doublets. 
Um, or, yeah, or debris or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, sure, that works. Yes. So this is, so E is basically the matrix we're going to be essentially working with for most of the stuff we're doing because it's the one that has really the important information on the channel measurements about the cells that we really care about. Um, but like Ryan said, there's a huge importance to the annotation of, of, of the data. So here's, when you type here in the console F and you do the at sign and you press the tab key, F is a flow frame object, remember? It's very computer science -y how what that means, object. It means that this flow frame object, it has those expression values that you see here, you know, the ones with all the numbers in it that we actually care about. It also has these parameters, whatever that is, let's see what it is. Okay, that wasn't super informative. It says some other object now. When you encounter a scenario like this, where you try to access something of the object and it tells you it's another object, it is Inception, oh my god. Do another at and another tab. <laughs> Play around with these things, print them out, see what they look like, and then tell me, in your opinion, which one is the most informative one. If you do it in a in a, just a uh, terminal, it will also it won't bring down such a nice menu like this, but it will print out all of the available things you could do. Yeah, yeah. Our studio just makes it a little bit more user friendly. Did you find something? Um. It's an accessor symbol. It's just like, you know, the square brackets we use to subset a vector, you know, take the third entry. Well, this isn't a vector. It's way more complicated. So we're going to use a fancier symbol than the square bracket. It tells you what you can do with that yeah. object. Yeah. So it doesn't do anything for the object. It just gives no, you it just, information what it's do. a way to access a thing that's in it. Yeah, it's just like using the square brackets for a matrix or a... You um, can think of it as like a, a full frame is sort of like a database. Yeah. And this code written that let me go into that database of data and look for stuff and do stuff with that. So this kind of looks a little bit interesting, doesn't it? The parameters <clears throat> and then data. That's sort of cool. Yeah, it's like it's pretty much when you print F, that's what it prints, right? But let me just go back to my code that's already kind of written. This actually, actually, let's do this. Let's assign this to be D. This is D, right? This is actually a matrix. So you can actually go D11, one, one, the very first entry of D is this. Let's take only the first row of D. It gives you, okay, this is this is parameter data, right? So it's information about the parameters we're working with. It tells me that this is, the name of it is forward scatter area. This is the, the range of the cytometer, how what it can me measure, what kind of values. And this is what the actual the actual values are within it. 23,406 is the minimum forward scatter that a cell had in this data set. To me, that tells me that chances are someone kind of removed the debris on the fly, you know, and whatever diva or whatever it is when you acquire the file. And the maximum uh, forward scatter value is 262,206. So when you plot this, you expect that there's going to be like 
a significant amount of cells just chopped off in the lower range, below 23,000 of forward scatter. And there's going to be you know, a bunch of cells and then some like flyaway cells up to 262,000. What if I get the last one? So this one was is this is the channel name. This is what it's measuring, CD127 expression. <clears throat> this is the, the range of the values. And the minimum value is this. It's negative. Weird. Maybe. I don't know. So it's on a logarithmic scale, so it's has some negative values. So this is just information that you, if someone gives you a file, you know, you want to know is it on a, like, you know, how some of them only go up to 1,024 in forward scatter, some of them go to 260,000. This is information you would want to know. Since it goes on a logarithm scale, how do you know that? We're not there yet. <laughs> it's coming up, though. Yeah, there is a way to tell. Yes. Here's something else, f at description, and it actually has, you can scroll through all these things. These are all metadata that's attached to the FCS file when you're, you, you know, running it on the cytometer and saving it as an FCS file. All these things automatically get saved. So it seems like a lot of gibberish, and a lot of gibberish, in fact, a lot of it. But there's actually some very useful things. For example, this keyword is called fill. Really, it's like file name. And this is the file name, if you recall, of the file that we just read in. So that's nice that it's saved somewhere. Date, July 17, 2007. So that's useful to know. You know, when was this file acquired? If you do do any kind of analysis and you find that there's a big difference between the two groups, but then you look at the dates and see, okay, well, these were all done before 2008, these were all done after 2008, they probably changed their laser or something. So that's one, one way we could, we could try to address that issue, quality control. The, op, the operator was administrator, so the person didn't really enter their name. We can't go after them for doing something wrong if they did. Something about... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all, all these keywords are defined, or the keywords, some of them are defined in the FCS standard, and there's a lot of custom keywords that you, you can just make them up. And, you know, and a lot of this information is always there, you just may not see it below the joint or schools you're looking at. It's just a way that lets you just that better. There's also something interesting here. Survival time from whatever, serial conversion, whatever that is, 63. That could be useful, maybe. So this, someone's a big master clinical That's what Ryan said. This is a custom keyword. This, uh, the, the, your computer, when you're acquiring your, your cells, is not going to ask you to enter this by default, but you can add this, like, entry that you require people when they're doing this analysis to always make sure they fully annotate the data, you know, at acquisition. So, some, so sometimes the data is going to be in your FCS header. Most of, a lot of the time it's going to be in an Excel spreadsheet or something that you can read in and edit it. And there's ways I think we can describe the data that you can apply. Yep, that's absolutely valid. So actually what, what's, what's I've done a few times, it's like, or like Ryan said, annotation is so important and so many issues arise from poor annotation to the point where I'm not aware that there's anything wrong with the annotation. The person giving me the data didn't really know that they made a typo somewhere in the Excel spreadsheet that they've given me. So then I can't see anything interesting in their data and I can't figure out why. And let's say that they give me an Excel sheet for this data with the file name and the survival time. And so, you know, I'm reading in the file names, you know, I'm reading in the files, and then I'm looking at the Excel spreadsheet for the survival time. But it's also inside of the FCS file. So that's the way I can do quality checking. I can check this file, according to itself, is 63 days survival, but in the Excel spreadsheet, it says 75 days. 
that's happened to me where it was 10,000 FCS files, mouse data collected over seven years, I think, and they gave me an Excel spreadsheet with 10,000 lines in it. So uh, what happened was, you know, different people were pasting like different parts of the Excel spreadsheet. Somewhere a row got shifted down one, and so everything was incorrect. Everything else from some point on was incorrect off by one row. But you know, you, it's not obvious. So, but something was off, so I had to go into the FCS file description and try to find something that I could do a quality check with. You know, for example, this this would be a good good quality check because I, I expect it to be slightly different between files and it's something I can double check with the Excel spreadsheet that I'm I've been given. And yeah, and it's if, it, and everything's wrong, right? Just being off by one means everything's incorrect. It happens a lot. Yeah. But so sometimes we forget about knowing your data. More things you can you think could go wrong, or really good things to check. So you know, again, quality checking, sanity checks along the way. As much as you can, yeah, because you don't want to be wasting your time analyzing data that is, you know, was annotated wrong. Inputting these. I mean, at the time of experiment and acquisition, it would be very time consuming. I mean, especially when you have to do panels and discovery experiment. And, and the it would be fine. 10 times more time consuming after the fact, right? If you make a mistake I'm in the saying, Excel spreadsheet. I'm not saying when you have to do it. So, for, for the, so Mario's labs have been anal. Um, <laughs> and so they, they were really careful about anti RCS files during acquisition. But you know, I totally get that that's not. Most of the time, you want to be sitting there and imitating this stuff. Well, there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's an error, there's an error there as well. Yeah, it's yeah. 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 So, so as long as you do it, some, <laughs> soon is better than never. Um, but you can do it. Excel is fine for that. You don't necessarily have to do the acquisition. So, if you put it all spreadsheets and read it later, that's fine. This, this is just showing information that's in the FCS header. Yeah, actually, so most of these things are automatically entered by the computer. You're not entering everything of this. The only thing you are entering is maybe your name when you're acquiring the files and maybe this number. And maybe like maybe one other thing there's in, in here that's custom. But all of these are otherwise automatically the psychometer sends that information to the computer. It knows how to save this for you. It's just like, I don't know if you've ever seen this where you take a picture with a really fancy camera and then you upload it. And then it tells you this was taken with shutter speed this and camera that and lens that. You know, somehow it knows, right? You're not entering that information. So it's the same here, but you can enter additional information that will help you. Um, the, really, the best place to do it is somewhere else. Yeah. It's much, it's, much easier to check and much easier to fix. So I do all that experimentation. I'll be talking on tomorrow about where other places you might want to annotate that. And there's much better places than your FCS header. Yeah, I I guess that, that's true. The, the problem that uh, could happen is when, when someone's entering the, the other information into the Excel spreadsheet and shifts it by one role. You know, then that doesn't really help it. So you, you always try to just read through the description that you have. You may be able to find some keyword that you could match it up for, for quality purposes when you have really large sets of data. Definitely, yes, absolutely, it. yeah. It's just a matter of catching that. In, in terms of annotation, if I could give one hint, is don't make your file names meaningful. I know that's what everyone does. Yeah, it, we, we've run into problems again and again and again because people try to make their file names mean something. And we've run into a lot of problems. You can see as well. You can see as well. Give an example. Sure, or like if, if you have, you know, file file one underscore b cell underscore s dot fcs, file two underscore t cell, blah, blah, blah. 
Then suddenly the T cell has a dash in the middle. It's capitalized, not capitalized. There's a comma out of nowhere. So I'm searching for the word B cell contained within the file name. And I'm getting some, but not some others because they were misspelled. There's B cell spelled B C L E L. You know, someone accidentally mis misspelled it. So it's those it kinds happens. of things. We've seen this a thousand times. You think you can tell people the biggest, absolutely, full stop, the biggest problem that we've had is people not following rules. And so you think you're going to be okay, you make up these rules, it doesn't work. And so it's very hard to fix it when it's in the file name. Um, it's much easier to fix it when it's in some metadata description. And so we, 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 our experience has taught us that annotation is best done separately from the data. So one, your data versus the, the FCS values separate from the metadata, which is everything else. That, that's just based on experience. Um, it might work for you. If it does, great. <laughs> so working with people that don't know how to find the metadata in the FCS files, they just want to plug it in Mojo or something. And, look at so, and, and this works great. So, so this, this is a different way of, so this is, we're trying to do a lot of stuff automated, right? And, and I'm trying to teach you things that can help you during the automated way. Some things kind of work in the Forger world. That doesn't work in the It really doesn't work in the automated world. And if you're going to go down this road after these two days, um, yeah, it's going to be the biggest problem. At least it's been, we've, and we've done this for lots of different labs, really, really good labs. I mean, fantastic. Harvard, MIT, Stanford. And these people, you tell them, and, and the people we're telling them are all other people. And this whole consortium got together and said, this is the way you're going to do things. And they don't follow the rules. They think it's a better way. And weeks of effort to, to undo these things. So, I'm not going to do the file name doesn't matter. The important part is that you have to get information attached to it somehow. Yeah. But the file name could be anything. So yeah, that's still do this. It doesn't matter as long as they can get it. As long as they have another. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. That's just a little tip. Do you have a slide with these rules that we can show people and say, you know, this is the way you should do? Even if yeah, yeah, so uh, I'm putting, putting together one because we're, we're having this workshop um, in a couple of weeks. And we're going to go through and list all these problems people following SOPs, and I'll, I'll share that afterwards. And that, it's, it's about getting people to follow the SOPs. It's very difficult. It's very <laughs> difficult. There's no stick. Okay, so oh. check that on the wiki. Yeah. In least we're still time, and we'll sort of error problem. Yeah, so, so what's the particular problem that you find? So, for example, so coming across a catalog and you manual the data and that side job, I will, for each FCS file, I'll actually say what the point of that FCS file was, and it's in demo for this channel, and this is the sample number. So, it's the, this, is, you know, this is the patient sample number, number 226, and this is the FMO for me. So, I said, fantastic, that's, that's what the FCS file's for. Uh, you want to have that in some kind of method. That would be that would be technically okay. I could work with that, but the problem is it's very prone to typos, right? Um, and it's very difficult to check that kind of thing when it's in the SES files one by one by one. Yeah. And it's very hard to go back. You can't. So one thing one thing about data is. Uh, sorry, I'm about to Data doesn't change. An MCS file is a data file. Once that's written, you don't touch it again. Right? That, that's, that's kind of the rule. You know, I was going to make one rule that we want. You never touch data, an MCS file. Because that, that, that can be clinical data. You don't want to start messing around with that. So the problem is, if you start including metadata inside your MCS file, information about other stuff, other than this cell and this rest of this measurement. That's really the only thing you want to get out of the MCS file. Making this other metadata, metadata changes, right? You got the diagnosis wrong. Um, we went back and looked at the patient, and you know some some other information that turned up they had a sex change, it was no longer male, now it's female, right? But the data, the FCS file, the sub measurements shouldn't change. Metadata can change, so you want to keep things that change separate from things that don't change. So minimal 
annotation on the FSS file is okay. Net maximal annotation on some other kind of place. That's your yeah. Best of the Yeah. Yeah. The reality is that when you're you don't want to send functions. You're like, my, my, my cells are on ice and they got to run them right now and you're checking stuff in and you got somebody talking to you and it's hot. Well, I have a counterexample to that actually. When uh, what also has had happened in that that mouse data set with ten thousand files is there was a keyword that was very important for them to manually enter, and it was uh, they had one of the markers was a lineage marker, so it actually changed from file to file, but the channel name stayed the same. So you had to actually change the, you know, in in here, you had to change, for example, what this says, you know, CD fourteen, should have changed it to B cell or T cell, whatever lineage you're going for. And what happened was someone had entered B cell, you know, for this file, and they ran it, and then they left, and another guy's like, oh, don't worry, I'll take over for you. They started running all these next samples and left that keyword static. So all the next samples were labeled as B cell, but they were not B cell. So, so that's not, that. so if you don't want to spend time adding those keywords, totally great. Just double check that you don't have one that is misleading left in there that's, like, saved for all the next samples. That's all. Uh, okay, let's move on. <laughs> this is a very passionate issue. So, uh, one last thing about that is having a training text to do that. You have an interesting combination of a person who adheres to protocol but also wants to do the minimum amount of work. Just be creative with your acquisition software. I mean, Backstiva allows for the incorporation of keywords that aren't even something that the user has to enter. Like your templates are used for specimen name, templates that are used for um, on the galleys and CSV, you have the same thing. If you're creative about how you're defining your panels, you can have no option for a user to adjust, you know, the, the CD marker on FL7 or something like that. So you can go beyond just telling people but how to do this. Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah, no, no, but you, <laughs> so, if you want to do something similar, except use, say, F square bracket, um, the column mm -hmm. number, right? mm -hmm. it's, instead of forward scatter, it's side scatter. Is it possible to do that? I so, don't know. Let's see. So a lot of times the parameter is very long. long. Yeah. No. So if Flowvis gives you a little bit of a weird error when it can do something, because it's seeing a flow frame object and then it's seeing numbers, and it doesn't think that's what that's not what it wants. They wanted a flow frame object in strings, things in quotes. However, I will show you a different way of doing what you want. In just I don't know when. Maybe I'll show it to you now. <laughs> I'm not sure where it's coming up. Remember our matrix A? So, what is that plot? The first column and the second column. So we can actually it plotted one eleven and two twelve. Or I don't two know actually one, what it plotted. Two one and eleven twelve. Yeah, okay, that's right. Well it's yeah, sorted. You can actually plot remember our, our matrix E that has all the expression values? These are the the first two the forward scatter area and side scatter area. That's gonna give us basically the same plot that we had before. And here I will tell you in one second. Now you can do one three instead of forward scatter side scatter. So the PCH is point character. It means what character am I going to use to do the, the, the dots? And I selected a dot. If you don't specify this, by default it does this like circle thing. Notice how it's taking a while because it's like they're so huge and it's it's going over top of each other. And there. Doesn't look very nice. So the plotting character means the character I'm going to use to plot. So every time you're plotting close to your files, you should use a dot because there's so many cells that otherwise you're not going to be able to see anything with these huge characters. So what, we didn't have that instruction before, so why was it using dots before? Because before, we were actually using the flow viz package and we were giving it a flow frame and it was smart enough to figure out what to do. It knew, like, for flow frame objects, use a dot. And if that was hidden information from you, but it was un going on in the background. Now, we're not relying on the fact that we're not using flow viz in this line here. Because, because we're just plotting some numbers we, in a matrix. Because we going back to a matrix we use before rather than flow. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Does this make sense? So that was a great question because it is very tedious to type out all the channel names and stuff all the time. But if you're like working with this data, you know that it's always the first and the third channel of forward scatter area and side scatter area. So the thing is, it applies to spade. The spade uh, is They make you type up the parameter names. Yeah. Um, another thing that I would do, which we, we were going to do actually tomorrow, or I think tomorrow. But instead of that, you could just say FSC equals. Can you do that? Assign these two variables here. And every time you want to type forward scatter dash A in quotes, you just type FSC. So when you go to plot it, it would be C without. Yeah. What? What? For what? Uh, like expressions. Uh, 
you don't have to type. Right. So, so, so for fun, some functions, if you're, you know, can't remember what it was, you can t press tab when you're partway through typing the function. So I, I was like this. I was like L E N G, and then oh, how do I spell length? I forget. Tab brings up all the things that start with length. Oh, in fact, it even has a shorthand for if you want to assign a length variable or something. So it, then you tab again, and it's going to select that first one, so you don't have to always type things. That's a personal preference thing. I, I never use it because yeah, it bothers me I'm, a I'm, lot. Yeah, so I'm the opposite yeah, okay. I didn't say that because I'm always moved. Oh my god, it bothers me so much. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> like I said, <laughs> personal preference. Uh, you might notice this looks a little more squished than it did before when we plotted it. Um, it's because... You can hardly see, but there's these little dots, you know, here, there's one, here, there's one, you know, I don't really want to waste my entire plotting region just so I could see that dot. So how can I make it so that it looks a little bit better? Is you can add another parameter to, uh, another piece of information to the plotting procedure to tell it how you want it to look. And that's Y limb. You know how this is your X axis and this is your Y axis? The y lim means the y axis limits. What values do you want to be looking at? And that's a vector of two, uh, of length two. So I want values between zero and 5,000. As far as I can see, this is 10,000, this is 5,000. Like that looks like really all I really care about. Does that make sense? So this plot thing, it's it's you know fairly straightforward in terms of you do you say plot my thing, but then you can specify exactly how you want your plot to look. For example, this point character thing, you can specify you know make try to make it look a little bit better, more understandable by specifying specifying you on this. Now, when you look at this, if I hadn't explained what any of this is to you. In the very beginning, you, you may have been a little put off by this line, right? What is this, like, E bracket, comma, C bracket, P PCH? It stands for concatenate, and it's put these numbers together into one vector. Sorry. It's a computer thing, you know, it's a so little in the abstract. Yeah, 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 that's what it usually is. Here it's C, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We should go deeper. Yeah. Um, this thing, this line here, is something you may typically see when you're reading one of those package vignettes where they go over an example of, oh, this is how you use our package. You do this, and then you do that, and then you do plot bracket E square bracket, comma, C, all these things. So I just want you to keep in mind that it may look more complicated than it actually is. Um, I mean, I guess it is a little complicated, but the plotting specifically has so many possibilities of making it look better. I'm, I'm trying to stay away from that right now because I don't want to confuse you too much. But, you know, it was necessary for us to plot only up to 5,000, otherwise it would look like crap. We wouldn't know what we're looking at. So, so far we've learned two ways to plot flow cytometry data. One was using the package flow viz, where you just give it the flow frame, this line. Give it the flow frame and the channel names. And another way is a little bit more customized. Oh, I guess I don't have it up there. Where you just plot the matrix of values. You can use the indices of the columns, which column numbers you want. You can assign variables to these channel names so you don't have to type it over and over. You can set your axis, y-axis limits to be something more suitable. Your x-axis, why don't we do that as well? How about you guys do that there, exercise? Set the x limits to be, x x-axis limits to be between whatever you think is suitable by looking at it. Go. Uh, no. Sorry, this <laughs> okay, good. Excellent. 
So what values did you choose? Uh, 20,200. Yeah. A little better, yeah. Now, why did I, why is it that uh, for the size scatter I had to cut it off like the 5,000, you know, it went up to a lot. Why did I have to cut it out so much? This is one of the things that is stored in those keywords and it's automatically stored by the computer uh, when you acquire the FCS files. Remember that the third channel, so call names, column names of F gave us all the parameters, right? All of the channel names. I'm subsetting it to the third one only. Here's all of them. Here's the third one only. That side scatter area. If you actually read through the description carefully, you would actually see this keyword. P3 stands for parameter 3 or whatever, something like that. I made up parameter. I assume that's what it says. Parameter 3 display. What scale should this be displayed on? And it says log. So actually, we should be taking the log of side scatter before we plot it, and then it will look nicer. That's why it doesn't look so great right now. What, what is the display scale for forward scatter area? How would you find that? Sure, replace the three with a one. Lin, linear scale. Sometimes you may have you know parameters in your data that are supposed to be on a log scale or on a linear scale. And this is one way that if you're not a biologist and automatically know these things, go check. <laughs> Okay, so let's stop for now uh, with this plotting, but let's for let's now read a. Yeah, we can get through this. It's kind of repeated a little bit. Let's read a flow set, not just one FCS file, but the whole set of FCS files. Remember, in this folder, full FCS, I actually have three FCS files. You can imagine you might have a hundred. You don't want to be doing read dot FCS one by one. You want to read all of them. This is how the function read.flow set works. You give it the path, which is the. So, this is how things work in R. You, you can specify path equals the, the parameter that the function read.flow set is expecting, or trust that the function is written well enough that it can guess what you're trying to do. So, for example, length takes x, some, something called x. You can do length, remember our vector y, we had our vector y's like this. Or you can specify, oops, it's still actually using y. The parameter name is x within the actual function. So in read.flowset, you have to specify the path to your data, which is the folder name relative to the current folder you're in, that's full FCS. And then this thing pattern that you can specify is .fcs. What this is gonna do is look at all the files in the path that you specified, all of these files, and it's only going to read the ones that contain the string .fcs. Because what could happen is here you might have hundreds of files and like a few of them are Excel spreadsheets. So you don't want R to be trying to read that as a flow, flow frame. Or you have organized your data really well and you don't need to worry about that, in which case you don't need to specify this parameter at all. You can just do that. So now run that, it's going to take a couple seconds. Or six seconds, seven. Remember how when it reads it, it gives you all these warnings because, you know, it's not necessarily perfectly annotated and some standard issues a little bit and then print it out. Remember how when you printed out F it said flow frame object at the top? Now it's a flow set object. It's so it's like a set of flow frame objects, like a list essentially. Very similar to list. And you can 
do remember how we did call names of f and that was like all the channel names you can also do that for the flow set it expects that all the things you're reading in have the same call, call names they have the same channels it's gonna complain if you try to read in a bunch of FCS files and some of them have you know CD3 some of them have CD10 it's gonna be like no I can't put these together here's some other things that functionality of how working with a flow set object sample names it names them based on their file names right these were the file names if you look at the folder there you can do length three I only have three FCS files in my flow set we did this one already all names I want to get this first one and there's two ways of getting it either by name or by Or remember with the list, how I had my list and it was like first and second. I could either just do the double square brackets and put one if I wanted the first object in that list. Or I can use the name of it instead. So if I had, if I had been reading in a bunch of FCS files and I wanted to get Bob's and I knew that his name was in the file, which would be terrible. You should never have the name. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I could... Go Oh yeah, me too. It's terrible. So this is a little a lot like a list of flow frame objects. So notice how the first one, it's just like a it's a flow flow frame object, right? You know how we used n row before? So I, let's say I, I have this first one and I want to see how many cells are in there. I can do n row of this flow frame object, 65,000. Now, if you have a hundred FCS files, you don't want to be, you know, n row of F FS2, FS3, and so on. You don't want to be typing that. So there's actually this FS apply function, which inception applies a function to each FCS or uh, to each FCS file within the flow set. So, for example, the function n row, which normally to a flow frame it does this, it gives you the number of cells. When I apply it to the flow set, it get, it actually applies that function to each entry of the flow set. Each flow frame gets that function. So if it's applied, flow set apply to each part of the flow set apply to this flow set apply this. But so if it applies actually the name of the function. Yes. If it's, it's just one yes, to yes, yes, yes. If I if if I call it flow set one instead, yeah. fs apply flow set one. The first thing is always which flow set are we are we going to be applying this to, and then what are we going to be doing? Yeah, so we just use n row. Yeah. And notice how it, it it has named each entry according to this, so that instead of uh, if I make this into a matrix B, <laughs> B the first entry, the first row is that, and it also has, sorry, it also has a name here. Or I can say, okay, for the file, what was the, how many cells were in there? So again, you can, even in the matrix, you can name your rows, and instead of saying, I want the first row or the tenth row, I want the row name this. So this would be a matrix within a matrix. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, yeah. Something like that. It's more like a matrix within a list of matrices. Like the flow set is a list, one thing in the list, another thing in the list, another thing in the list. Each of those things is yeah. a flow frame yeah. which has a matrix. Yeah. Here's a fancy FS apply. What did this do? Mm. 
Yeah, it went through, and the, the first one had this tube name, the second one this tube name, the third one this tube name. Okay, I have like four minutes left, so almost. Is everyone okay if I take four minutes? Good. So everything is a flow frame inside of the flow set, right? So you can kind of subset the flow set and pretend like it's just F or F from before. So you can do things like plot it just like you, you did before. There. It looks a little bit different than the first one, right? This is the second one. You can save the matrix of expression values just like we did before of, let's say, the first one. And now let's extract just the forward scatter values by taking this matrix E. Remember, it has like the rows or the cells, the columns or the parameters. And now I have extracted only the FCS file, so I'm going to print out the very first 10 of them. So the first 10 cells, these are the, oh, sorry, FCS, forward scatter values. Now I can plot the density of these. There's actually, you know, 60,000 of them, right? I only plotted the or printed the first 10. Let's plot the density. So in this flow frame, most of the cells are around 20,000 and 100,000 actually. So when you were cutting off your plot, you could have cut it off at 100,000 and you would have seen pretty much most of them. There's a little kink here. Do you guys see it? Very small, like little kink there. Those are all these cells that are on the margin. Those are when the oscillometer can't measure anything higher than that value, so it just gives it that value. We're going to get rid of those later. Another super cool thing about plotting in R, and this is the last thing I'm going to show you before lunch. This PAR it stands for parameter, and it kind of sets. Before we start plotting, I'm going to make my plotting setup a little better. MF row, it means that it. It's going to have three rows and one column, the next plotting thing that I'm going to do. And this is what happens. I'm going to plot the first. What I'm plotting here is the first flow frame, right? I'm taking the first one, forward scatter, side scatter. Let's do that. Plus it here. Second and third. So what this par MF row C31 thing did was it just set up my plotting region to have three rows and one column. So the next three things I'm going to plot are going to go into those slots. That was not on, yeah, it was on purpose. I wanted to see him catch it. Very good. See, I copied and pasted and I didn't change it. Yeah, yeah, I just, uh, so, so main means main title of the plot. So when you, when, when you add this thing to the plot function, main equals, you can also say, oops, third, oops. So now when I plot it, Says third. <laughs> yeah. And that's all I'm going to show you right now. Is it possible to have the flaws actually be uh, sort of, yeah. You would like to. Like a, a 
x-axis or y plus. Just put them yeah, kind of like that, except like completely over. There is a lot of uh, um, oops, a, a lot of options that you can do. So de definitely you can do that, but you would have to, yeah, that's one way. Or um, yeah, I would. I honestly haven't done that exact thing that you said, but uh, if you look at question mark. If you look at question mark par, that's the thing I used here to make the region three by one. You can scroll on forever and ever and ever and ever and read about all the things you can set. Here's what I was using. And it explains kind of what it does here. So there is definitely a way. I just don't know off the top of my head. You could probably Google it. Okay. Uh, is this good? Or does anybody want to ask me anything? Feel free.